In today's video, we're going to be talking about expat tax. Good day, my name is Heinrich, we are the owner of SA County Network and over the years we've had many, many different inquiries about people immigrating and I decided to put in some of the big guns today. We're going to be talking to some of the guys at Tax Consulting SA and I think the two main answer questions that we want to try and answer today is if you decide you want to go work overseas, what do you do? And if you decide that you want to immigrate, what do you do? So I think before we go any further, remember to like the video, subscribe to my channel as well and let me get onto my computer then I'll introduce the guys to you. Good day, Victoria and Tom. Um, it's lovely having you guys on my, on, on my channel. And um, maybe just if you just want to give me a quick introduction, you know, who you are, where you're based, what do you do? I think, Victoria, maybe you first. Sure. Great. So we are tax consulting, and me and Tom specifically specialize in expatriate tax. Uh, me more so in the uh, seizing of your tax residency more permanently. Uh, and Tom in the annual route, but there's a few various routes that, that we deal with, but uh, we deal with a very specialized niche part that's very complex. Um, so we are definitely the experts in making sure you're compliant in your tax residency status. Awesome. Tom? Uh, yeah, well, as Victoria said, we deal with all things expat in this firm. Uh, as she mentioned, her department deals more with the cessation of tax residency and all the complexities that come with that. And I run a team within the firm that deals with double taxation agreements and your different little niggly bits that you might need to deal with each year as an expatriate if you're not ceasing your tax residency or doing so permanently. Yes. And just something that I just want to mention as well, it's just a little bit of my history with your firm. Um, uh, there was probably about three or four years ago, I went through a, you know, a really stressful thing that SARS decided to do a diesel refund audit. And I've never even in my life heard of something like that. I, I've got a client who's in this fishing industry and SARS decided to look at two years worth of bad refunds that they wanted to audit. They were looking for logbooks and photos and you can't believe all the details. And you know, there was one guy there, tax consulting, he said, Darren Brits. And he really helped me through that process. So I'm really ever grateful for you guys for the help and stuff that you did. And, and you know, I always say to my clients that, that for us as normal accountants and tax practitioners, you know, I always see myself as a GP that I know, that I know a little bit about, you know, just the general tax stuff, you know, but as soon as something becomes specialized, if you go to the doctor and he says there's something funny in his skin and he's not sure what to do, he's going to refer you to a specialist. And I think that is exactly where you guys fit into the picture as well. You know, if you look at expat tax, it's such a specialized field that I think the normal tax consultant out there would not have all the answers to be able to give the right advice. And that's obviously one of the reasons why we're doing the video as well. So I think I'm just going to shoot with the first question. I just made, made a list of a couple of questions. So the first thing is, um, is who is expat tax relevant to? Where does it fit into the picture? So it is relevant to anybody uh, who works abroad who is a South African tax resident. Uh, now, South African tax resident, it's quite vague, but anyone that's worked and lived here, uh, you know, you're most likely a tax resident. Uh, so it's good to check your position. But if you're working abroad, you need to consider tax in South Africa. It doesn't automatically just disappear because you got on a plane and left. Okay, and that's good. And um, so the general rule for South Africans working overseas, so if I decide I'm, I've got a job and I'm out of here, um, what is the general rule? I remember there's a certain amount of days you have to be out of the country. Do you want to be fast? Maybe you want to expand a bit on that for me? Yeah, so there's definitely a few different tests uh, and a few different exemptions that uh, these day rules apply to, but it's quite commonly confused. Um, the physical presence test where it's the 91 days per annum and then the foreign income exemption, which is the 183 days abroad per annum you have to meet. But either way, uh, whichever way you look at it from in terms of if you meet all these tests, if you've been abroad for many years, if there's double taxation agreements in place, uh, nonetheless, nothing's automatically applied in South Africa, uh, South African tax. The onus of proof falls solely on the taxpayer to evidence, declare, formalize anything and everything. Therefore, you can't take it with uh, just a, a pinch of salt thinking, I'm leaving, I'm meeting all those days, I'm fine, I don't have to declare or do anything. Sadly, that's not the case. You need to make sure that you, you are compliant and, and doing the right thing. Yeah, <clears throat> that's good. And, and I remember following on the news, I know 2021 has started that financially, there was quite a big thing that changed. 
in terms of expat tax. And I think that is where the whole stirring started. You know, there was a couple of changes. Do you guys maybe just want to have a quick chat about what changed in that year and why all of a sudden there's such a big issue? Sure. So there actually have been quite a few changes uh, in terms of expatriate tax. Um, it used to be that uh, if you met that certain criteria of the day's test and that, and if you were an employee, uh, you were allowed to kind of almost um, be exempt from all of your foreign employment income. Uh, however, SARS decided that it's no longer going to be the case. They actually wanted to completely dispose of the exemption back in 2017. Uh, we actually went to Parliament and opposed it on behalf of a South African expat group. And we kind of got a, a win, which says, okay, we are going to postpone this. And we're not going to get rid of the exemption. We're just going to put a cap on it. So now they've capped it to 250,000 rand. That's what the big change that happened last year in 2020. And then the big change that happened this year is that the Reserve Bank that used to be involved in the process of financial immigration has pulled away and has left it up to SARS and each authorized dealer, being all the banks and the policy providers, to now deal with all non-resident uh, transactions, remittances, tax, all of that stuff. That's good. Um, so uh, obviously, if I, if I earn more than that the threshold, that 1.25 million rand, in our work overseas, it's been as I pay tax that side. You know, if I work, I know like so some of my clients work in Germany and they get taxed quite heavily that side. So it depends as I end up, if I converted to South African rent, I earn 3 million rent, but I pay a crap load of tax that side. How does that work? Or would I get a tax rate in South Africa for the taxes I've paid or how does that work? Thomas, I think you can go ahead with this one. I see you are. Victoria. Uh, that's exactly the case. If you're an employee and you're working abroad, uh, subject to you meeting the requirements and the qualifying periods uh, of time abroad, you would be eligible for that 1.25 million rand uh, exemption in South Africa. Now, if you're earning above that number uh, and you're subject to tax in Germany, it's a very important thing that you said there, Heinrich, that they're paying at, they're paying tax at a higher rate than they would in South Africa. So what happens in this case, uh, or what would happen in this case, is they would their tax would be calculated in South Africa and they would claim what's called a foreign tax credit uh, to offset their South African liability due to the taxes paid in Germany. Now, when you apply that credit in addition to the 1.25 million Rand exemption, that credit is proportional. So you'll get a proportional credit for a portion of the German taxes paid. And the ratio will be, you can exempt the same portion of German tax in the same ratio as what remains taxable in South Africa after the 1.25 million Rand exemption. In that case, if it's a higher tax rate in Germany, there should not be a remaining tax liability in South Africa. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, I think a lot of people ask that question. They don't always know exactly how to how to do that. Um, so the big question is how do you avoid paying those taxes? I think that's the million dollar question that everybody's asking is how not to pay taxes. I think the easier way is not to earn money. Then you don't need to pay the tax. <laughs> Generally. <laughs> yeah. But is there a way to avoid paying the, any taxes? Uh, you absolutely can avoid paying taxes depending on your circumstances. Uh, for example, if you're, if you're not intending on coming back to South Africa on a permanent basis, other than, you know, visits and holidays and vacations, whatever it may be, then you would be advised properly to cease your South African tax residency by way of financial immigration. Uh, on the other hand, if you are, uh, if you do intend to come back to South Africa and at the same time are seen as a tax resident in the other country, which is the case even in countries that don't impose personal income tax, uh, you can uh, deem yourself to be exclusively resident in the other country and not South Africa. Uh, by way of a double tax agreement, which is not permanent, and that relief must be claimed every year. Uh, so those would essentially be your two primary options, and shall I say, minimalist approaches to to avoid 
ceasing residency either permanently or deemed residency temporarily. That's good. Mm-hmm. So if I decided stuff it, I don't want to be, be, be a tax resident in South Africa anymore, how do I do that? I said, that's easy as just picking the box on the return. Say, Sorry, I'm not resident anymore. Cheers, guys. <laughs> that we, we get that question quite often. Unfortunately not. Like I said earlier, the onus of proof is on the taxpayer, which, again, proof isn't as simple as just saying and ticking it. Um, there is a formal declaration process you have to go through, um, and that is financial immigration. You have to prove that you have a permanent intent. You have to formalize it, legalize it, go through to with SARS. Now with your authorized dealers, previously with the Reserve Bank, um, it's quite a long process of between three to five months. Um, so it's not a matter of just ticking a box. That's why I say always go find professional advice, someone that knows what they're doing is keeping up with legislation because the the requirements keep changing as well. Uh, so it's always good to have someone helping you uh, when, when you want to seize your tax residency. Uh, the other important thing I always say to people is make sure you qualify to seize your tax residency because it's not as simple, oh, you know, I just want to and that's it. You know, I don't want to pay tax. Let me seize tax residency. There's certain criteria you have to meet to be able to qualify for that. And then they're on declare and prove your non-residency. Even, even, even on the other side where you're temporarily ceasing your residency, for example, in terms of a DTA, in that case, it does boil down to a SARS submission, but in almost invariably, you'll have a deep SARS order to verification asking you for a whole laundry list uh, of items. And you'll need to make sure that you meet those evidential requirements and the requirements in the DTA to, to be non-resident and have that accepted by SARS. So to so go back to what Victoria had said, you need to make sure that you're with an expert who knows what they're doing and have done this before. Yes. I think while, while we're talking about that, I think it's a good time to maybe talk a little bit about misconceptions. I think there's a lot of different misconceptions. I think the classic one is the people just get on the plane and they out of here and they just decide, listen, I just turn a blind eye and never need to worry about tax anymore in South Africa. Are the misconceptions that you guys know about? You obviously work with it on a more regular basis. Yeah, there's quite a few. I think, Tom, maybe go through the DTA ones because I think those are the most common ones we get. Um, and then I'll go through the, the rest of them. No, absolutely. Uh, firstly, when it comes to double tax agreement relief, DTA relief, it does not apply automatically. In fact, a vigilant taxpayer will see that there is room for DTA disclosures on their tax return form. The other misconception that we see is uh, that a DTA is a one trick pony. You know, uh, all that a DTA does is say that you will pay tax in one country and not in the other, which isn't true. You know, a double tax agreement will allocate taxing rights and that includes uh, with regard to tax credits, which means that you don't only pay tax in one country necessarily, Uh, At worst, though, you'll pay the higher aggregate rates of tax between the two countries, but not double tax. And uh, the final one is that having proof that you are resident in the other country will allow you to see South African tax residency in terms of the double tax agreement, which again is not true. As mentioned earlier, there are still further requirements that must be met in terms of the DTA to qualify. Uh, That's more or less uh, the most common misconceptions on the, shall I say, part-time non-residency aspect. Uh, Perhaps Victoria can elaborate a little bit more on the financial immigration parts of things. And actually, the the main one we probably would both receive is that, how will SARS find me once I've left the country? (laughs) (laughs) That is a biggie. Uh, And unfortunately... Yeah, there's various ways they can find you. Um, and well, firstly, there's the common reporting standards, a few other, you know, uh, international share of information things that are happening. So if you're a tax resident here, yeah, SARS has the right to pull your information from banking to earnings to investments, whatever it is from anywhere in the world uh, and audit you on that. Um, the other thing that we're seeing quite lately is SARS is now... Um, 
obviously looking for people that have not been paying or declaring or, uh, you know, doing the due diligence in terms of their expatriate tax. And they've even gone as far as, uh, you know, um, sending summons and things like that through social media platforms and things like that. So they can find you one way or another. You know, it might not be today or in a year or two, but eventually they will find you if, if you haven't complied. Unfortunately, there's no hiding from SARS. There's no hiding from tax or evading tax. These are the things probably of the past, um, you know, with modern world and technology and, and all these agreements in place, uh, there is no hiding. The other misconceptions that come are if you do say you want to seize your tax residency, uh, people get confused. They think, oh, do I have to give my citizenship up? Do I, can, I can't have anything in South Africa anymore. I have to close everything up. That's not the case. Um, so citizenship and tax residency are not aligned in any way. Okay, the one is a home affairs status, the one is a SARS status. So you could be, you could have given up your citizenship, your South African passports and become a British citizen for years now does not mean that you have seized your tax residency in South Africa. So that's a very important one that people confuse. They think I've given up my citizenship. SARS cannot touch me. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And the way I always try to explain it to people is when you went over to your foreign country, you didn't have citizenship, perhaps, but you still became a tax resident because it's a tax residency system. It's not doesn't have to do with your citizenship. Um, there's very few of those left in the world now, the citizenship-based systems. Most countries are residency-based. Yeah, there's only two left, actually. Yes, you're right. Um, the other misconception is that you don't have to get rid of everything in South Africa when you seize your tax residency, be it the annual way or the once-off way. You could absolutely keep assets, you invest, you could even get credit now with the new regime. So it's not cutting ties. You have to, you can continue to invest and, and they want they want you to invest, you know, bring cash flow into the country, even credits as cash flow. So uh, it's not as if you're not allowed to do anything or the last thing, misconception that I often get is I can't come visit anymore, which is not the case at all. <laughs> uh, you can absolutely come visit. Uh, you can, you know, continue as normal. It's just a matter of proving where taxing rights belong to uh, in terms of your earnings. Um, I think that's the main ones we get. Uh, anything else you can think of, Tom? Uh, the only, the only other one uh, that I that can really comes to mind is, but I've been outside of South Africa for more than three hundred and thirty days, or I've been out of South Africa for mm -hmm. ten years, or whatever it is. Yeah, I've met all the residency tests that exist. You know, that's more for the more educated taxpayer that's read into it a little bit. Unfortunately, again. Maybe this is the biggest one, actually, Tom. Nothing is automatically applied. You have to declare and show and evidence everything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. And I think, um, yeah, just talking on that, um, and I remember I worked with a case a while ago about the guy that, that, that went to go work in Dubai. And Dubai is quite a hard topic. And I think there's a lot of other countries as well there that's basically got almost like zero tax rates where they don't pay any tax. And they can never get residency there you know, or citizenship. You know, what do those guys do? Are they going to be tax residents in South Africa for the rest of their lives? Or can they get out of the net? Or what do those type of people do? Well, actually, you know, specifically Dubai, the UAE, uh, recently things have changed. You're now able to get permanent residency there for purposes of retirement in certain instances. But definitely the point is taken usually around the GCC region, the Middle Eastern region, and those countries that don't often impose personal income tax. Uh, what, what happens there is a Uh, in which case their earnings above uh, 1.25 million rand will continue to be taxable in South Africa. But it, it creates a very difficult situation for those residents because uh, even when they terminate their employment, uh, they earn a certain gratuity bonus on top in most cases. 
and they find themselves fully exposed to South African tax on that. So where they qualify, the advice would definitely be for them to cease their South African tax residency on an interim basis uh, in terms of a double taxation agreement, which South Africa does have which, with each of the, the, uh, the, the countries in that region, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, UAE, for example. And uh, when they do return to South Africa and thereby cease their UAE tax residency, for example, they'll simply continue being a resident in South Africa from then onwards, pay tax on a worldwide basis in South Africa from then onwards, but still protecting their retrospective uh, UAE-based foreign income. Oh, that's good to know, yeah. Um, another question that I've got here, does the DEPA decide um, to become non-resident for tax purposes in South Africa, what's the tax implications? Is the capital gains tax anything like that involved? Obviously, you know, there's been a lot of stuff on the news floating around the topic. Do you guys maybe just want to explain a little bit on that one as well? Absolutely. So when you seize your tax residency, be it the annual route with the DTA or financial migration ones off, there is an exit tax. We always call it the exit tax, but it's an actual fact, a deemed disposable capital gains tax. So they would consider on the day before you seize your tax residence that you're kind of disposing of your capital assets worldwide and reacquiring them. So they can tax you on any gain up until that point. Then your new base, base value becomes as of that date. However, it's so complex and so dependent on the situation. And there's so many things that most people might not even consider. I mean, we've had an example of a client where they own a horse and this horse you know, it could be seen as a capital gain asset because it's, uh, you know, if it races or it brings an income, um, it's got a value. So there are many things that people don't consider. Krugerrands, cryptocurrency, Tom can speak on that a lot. People think crypto doesn't have any tax on it. Um, but yeah, it is quite a serious thing. It's probably the most, the biggest hurdle you have to kind of overcome when seizing your tax residency, because great, you get all these benefits of, you know, you don't have to pay tax on foreign income or assets, all these things. But unfortunately, SARS wants its departing um, exit, because what happens when you seize your tax residency after that, so if you do go the once off route, uh, you're basically saying goodbye to them in other types of capital gains future wise. The only thing that they will tax you still on capital gains tax as a non-resident is any property in South Africa or property rich company in South Africa. That's why it's very important to make sure you, you do it the right way and you're smart about it uh, with your practitioner to figure out the exact dates and the values and, and what would be most suitable for you. Um, some people choose to just sell off assets, actually dispose of them uh, so that they can pay and afford this exit tax. Other people have the funds, so then they say, I want to keep my assets. It's a very person, case-by-case -case situation. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. I think we, we answered a lot of questions. I think um yeah, I think maybe next I want us just to maybe sketch a couple of scenarios, you know, just things that, that that we've seen or that we've heard over the years. And I think it's just a little bit of a fun exercise. I think that the classic example is like somebody that maybe finished school, they used to work at Spur or one of these places and they got a tax numbers like donkeys years ago, went overseas, they went to go work in a bar or a pub or something in London, and maybe even worried about even concerned about South African tax. They, now they, maybe they say, for instance, in their 30s, they bought a house and they settled there, they've got a nice job. What do those guys do? Because obviously they still have a tax now in South Africa. Well, in that case, yeah, we, we would advise with not, not hefty, but a little bit of concern. Uh, and it, would, it sounds like in that case, the individual might need to retrospectively either re correct their return submissions to properly claim that section 10102, the 1.25 million rand exemption, uh, because even though they would qualify for it, and technically there's no prejudice to the fiscus in South Africa if they did meet the requirements, it's still a requirement to make that disclosure so that SARS can test that they were eligible for it and confirm such. Uh, otherwise, what that individual might be able to do uh, is cease their tax residency on a backdated basis. And the question that any diligent tax advisor would lead with in this case is, what is your intention? 
Is your intention to return to South Africa on a permanent basis at any point in future, for example, retirement? Uh, what is your current intention? You know, it may change over time with changing circumstances, but that dictates what happens next. If the answer is yes, then either it's claiming that up to 1.25 million rand exemption, or if necessary, if they're earning non-employment income as well, temporarily ceasing their South African tax residency until such a time that they return in terms of the double tax agreement between the two countries. On the other hand, if they are not coming back, financial immigration would be backdated in this case as a student. Excuse me. As a student, it's unlikely that they would have uh, a large exit tax or exit charge liability. So uh, financial immigration might be a very convenient way to go that cures the issue with minimal intervention. Yeah, that's good to go. No, because I think a lot of people are scared that if you own a house now in London and you've got these events and some shares and, you, and you've got assets and stuff, then people think that if I give my tech residency, I mean, and that, that, that I might sit with this big exit tax bill. You know, I think that is one thing that, um, that, 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 that is almost, and it's not a great area, but I think you just need to be very careful about that, about how you approach it. And that's obviously where you guys fit into the picture to get the right advice. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the next scenario, so somebody that decided they moved, wanted to move to Australia, they, they sold their house, they went through the whole immigration, financial immigration process to get the access to the retirement funds, and they got Australian citizenship. Is there anything else that they need to do? Is that it? Is the what do they need to do? So it's a bit complex in a case by case. Uh, but in this specific scenario, say they they do have retirement funds they want to withdraw, and uh, look, the citizenship again, it won't matter. Um, but they have formally seized the tax residency in this scenario, so that's good. Uh, which means they're allowed to withdraw the retirement annuities in full early before retirement, before maturity. However, they need to comply with certain criteria. And the main latest change uh, that's come about is that they have to be non-tax resident for three years before they're allowed to exercise that right. Again, they don't have to exercise that right. They might actually keep them here if they choose to. A lot of people do choose to keep retirement funds here, depending what country they're in and if that country offers a better solution. Um, but it's it's if you want to withdraw them, you have to make sure you meet the three years non-residency. And it's quite a tricky uh, way of applying through the policy providers. So again, I'd, I'd get an expert to help you with that withdrawal. That's good. Yeah, so if I may, yes, yes, go for it. If I may, uh, again, putting in that double taxation agreement angle, mm -hmm. there are some countries around the world that South Africa has DTAs in place with that allocate the sole taxing right over retirement interests to only the country of residency. And I believe Australia is one of them. Uh, so in this instance, normally, uh, SARS would withhold the tax or the policy provider would withhold the tax on the retirement interest and pay that over to SARS. But regard must always be had for the double tax agreement to make sure that SARS is not withholding that tax. We lost you there for a second. We uh, lost sorry. you there. <laughs> yeah, just in, in certain cases, regard should be had for a double tax agreement to make sure that tax isn't being withheld where it shouldn't be withheld. Uh, otherwise, it might lead to a double tax issue in the other country. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think I'd say the one last thing in a scenario like that, that we also get the same question quite often is, because you've financially immigrated or you've done the double taxation agreement, you've seized your tax residency, you don't have to submit returns anymore. Unfortunately, that's not the case. You're still a taxpayer. You're just a non-resident taxpayer of South Africa. So it is advisable to continue. Well, it's actually legally required for you to continue to declare any South African sourced income to SARS. Uh, you can only really break up with SARS um, and not submit any returns after you've seized your tax residency and come 
completely gotten rid of everything in South Africa, no assets, no liabilities, not even bank accounts, then you're allowed to deregister and not submit returns. But we don't often advise that, um, especially for people that might have inheritance coming their way or they want to reinvest in the country, because it's just so much easier if you've kept your return up to date once a year uh, in terms of a financial event like that. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, so two last questions. And I think I mentioned it right in the beginning of the video as well. If I get a job overseas, what do I do? And the second thing, if I decide that I want to jump on the plane, I've had enough of the load shedding and the crime and all that stuff, I'm out of here. I want to immigrate. What do I do? Those two questions. I think that's the bottom line that we want to try and get answered today. Understood. Uh, I think let me tackle the first and Victoria, you tackle the second. So if you get a job overseas, first thing you need to do is obviously make sure that you have the right to work in that country from a, you know, an immigration perspective. Once you're in country, you then have the tax issue. Uh, it's always, always prudent to try and seek advice from an expert uh, in expatriate tax at as early, an, as early a stage as possible. And as a rule of thumb, uh, Tax planning is only effective when you're in the planning phase. Uh, so outlining what your intentions are, what your circumstances are and will be, uh, a prudent tax advisor will lead with those elements. A prudent tax advisor will lead with those elements and first ask, where are you going with this? Are you coming back? Is the, are you leaving with a view to leaving permanently? Are you leaping countries from there? What is happening? And in that case, you'll probably have an outline provided to you uh, of what will be happening in your scenario. And in most cases, just to reiterate, it'll either be that you claim that expat tax exemption of up to one point. Or if you're earning above 1.25 million rand, uh, or you're not an employee, or the circumstances just don't accord with that being the appropriate relief, it may be ceasing your tax residency, again, either temporarily in terms of a double tax agreement between the two countries, or permanently uh, in terms of financial immigration, if that's the appropriate route to take. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good answer. I really like that answer. Victoria? <laughs> You want to speak with you with the second this, question? Yes, the second one. So if you've had enough of South Africa. <laughs> um, yes, it's obviously one, consider your, uh, your visa, your right to live and work abroad, where you're going, what's happening. Never forget about tax. That's the last thing anyone thinks about when they're moving their entire life. Uh, I know because you have to go through visas, through things, through, you know, maybe some people ship their uh, whole container worth of life things or their pets or, you know, moving children from school and things. It's a lot. It's a, a literally a life change. So SARS gets forgotten very, very often. So what I would advise is always consider that, be it after you've left, which is then correcting any uh, non-compliance tax-wise, or like Tom said, tax planning before time. Uh, it is vital not to just think I'm leaving, forget SARS, nothing can happen to me. It's really, really vital that you make sure you're compliant and that you take the right route in terms of protecting your foreign income and future assets that you're gonna acquire abroad once you start setting up your life that side. That's good. Yeah, that's a good answer. And I think, yeah, I think with that, I think the don't think the only other question that I've got is where do people get hold of you if they decide that they want to get some help with with um with this whole expat tax thing? And um obviously you guys are from Tax Consulting SA, and I will put the link of the of the of your website in the description as well. I see that on the website there's quite a few nice nice articles, just some frequently asked questions that you guys um, explain a bit more in detail. But if somebody just decides, okay, sure, I'm in trouble, I need to get all the Victoria of Tom. What do we do? Can they get all of you on the phone? Do they send an email? Absolutely. The they can reach us directly on our personal emails even. And we actually offer a free consultation to vet the client situation first and then advise what the best route would be. Um, I mean, my email address is victoria at taxconsulting.co.za and Thomas is thomas at taxconsulting.co.za. Um, but we can put them in the link below as well. I will definitely put them in the link. Yes, yeah. I don't think there's anything else that I want to ask you that we want to discuss. Anything else that you guys maybe just want to mention that might be worth mentioning before we close the video? 
always remember that hiding your head in the sand and simply always remember that hiding your head in the sand and or leaving South Africa in the dust and trying to forget about it won't work. Uh, in most cases, your tax situation really isn't as scary as it might appear to be, uh, just as long as you have an expert and experienced hand guiding you along the way, you have nothing to worry about. Perfect. Yeah, thank you guys once again. I think that's it for today. I'm really, really, I'm, I'm really grateful that I managed to get this interview set up. I wanted to do it for a very long time already. And it's really nice to catch up with you guys and to chat with you. And um, yeah, just for everybody watching as well, remember to give it a like, hit the subscribe button. And if you do, guys, you guys do need help, remember to get all the Victoria and Thomas. Thanks for watching and uh, keep an eye out for the next video. Thanks.